Hi everyone. For today's class, what I want to show you is how you can use modern software, in this case Cadence PSPICE, to solve or at least confirm some of your solutions in your homework. This may seem like it should be a simple operation, but what we do in college and what we do in industry are different in several ways and one of them is how we approach problems. In, in college we can make up problems of any sort and ask A for B and C for D, but in industry usually you have certain inputs for your problem and then you have to use your software tools to help you solve those. So let's take a look at problem 2-4 in cinema. Okay, so here's the problem statement. 2-4. The following voltage waveform is seen on an oscilloscope connected to the input of a length of faulted RG8 A slash U line. Determine the fault location from the sending end and the fault impedance. Ignore any losses. This waveform we see here, we see a voltage going from 0.8 to 1 volts at 5 microseconds, is at the input to a piece of RG8 cable. Now that RG8 cable is a 50 ohm cable, you can find it in the book and the tables in chapter 1. The velocity of propagation of that cable is 66% of the speed of light and which will make it 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Uh, and we can ignore the losses of the coax, so we don't care about that. All right, so what, uh, another term in here, a faulted a transmission line. So what does that mean? Well, a fault is any change in impedance associated with the a transmission line setup. Now in the old days, if we had open wire line out in the um, environment, uh, maybe a tree branch or uh, some insulation could fail on it, and that would create a change in impedance of the transmission line. Um, it can happen with coax also, possibly, um, you know, someone digs uh, a coax line up to break it, or maybe in a building someone is uh, posting or um, mounting something and they accidentally put a nail through a piece of coax. I've seen that happen before. So let's try and create a circuit picture associated with. So we're going to draw a picture that uses a source, which is going to be a square wave source or a pulse, and then a piece of transmission line, and then a fault. Okay, so here's the circuit I have created for that problem. On the left hand side we see a pulse or square wave generator with a 50 ohm impedance. That's typical for uh, sources. Now that wasn't specified in the problem, but by well, the waveform we know we see a rising edge at time zero. You could have uh, um, treated that as like a battery being switched on. But that's not the normal situation. Normally it'll be a pulse or square wave type generator. And we see our cable, uh, our G8 A slash U. The length is unknown and then we have the fault impedance at the end. And the oscilloscope or the view of the waveform we're looking at is at the front of the line. So how are we going to solve this? Well first off let's break it into two parts. First, let's determine the length of the transmission line. Now, the length of the transmission line is related to the time delay we see on the scope waveform. We see that at the input to the line, something happens at 5 microseconds. The voltage goes from 0.8 to 1 volt. That can only occur when we have a signal go down and be reflected back to the input. So the chain, the five microseconds we see here is related to the time, transit time to go down and back. So the length 
of the transmission line is actually related to two and a half microseconds or halfway down. We don't see it on our oscilloscope until five microseconds because of the fact that it has to go down and be reflected back. All right, so let's write the math out. So here's the math. The length is equal to velocity of propagation times time delay. The velocity of propagation is 0.66c on that type of cable, which makes 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The time delay is actually one half of the 5 microseconds because the length of the cable only is traveling this far. We see 5 microseconds change because of the double the length. All right, so if we work the math out, 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second times 2.5 microseconds, it turns out to be a 500 meter cable. All right, does that sound reasonable? Well, we know in the lab we had a 7 meter cable, the 25 foot one, and had 38 nanoseconds. So, we, that's a much, this is a much longer cable on the order of maybe 80 times longer. And so 500 meters and two and a half microseconds seems pretty reasonable. We'll check that in the simulation. Okay, so the next part of the problem has to do with the waveform. Now we see at, at time zero, the voltage jump from zero volt to 0.8 volts. And then after five microseconds, it goes to one volt. Now we are at the beginning of the transmission line. So the only way we can see a voltage like this is that if the voltage travels down the line, is reflected back by the gamma of the load, and then we see the end result at point at the input to the line. So first off, we need to know what is the initial voltage uh, situation. Now remember, I told you you should always make a little circuit drawing for the initial situation. Situation will assume that the transmission line is the only component because the faulted, in this case the faulted impedance, is not part of the initial circuit because we haven't seen its reflection. So we want to focus on this part of the circuit. Okay, so now we've got an initial circuit. We have the pulse generator, 50 ohms. We have a cable of 50 ohms, and we have a voltage of 0.8. All right, so we see the 0.8 volts and the input to the cable. Well, because we are matched, 50 ohm source, 50 ohm cable, Obviously, the voltage pulse back here would have to be 1.6 volts. So the step up of the pulse will be from 0 to 1.6 at the generator. Half of that voltage is lost in the impedance match. This is very common that you lose half of your voltage in the source to a cable connection but we like even though we don't like to lose voltage it's important to keep everything matched all right now let's move on to the uh, the wave traveling down the line okay so we have 0.8 volts being sent down the line as the incident voltage that's going to travel down the line in two and a half microseconds and reach the fault at the receiving end so now we're ready to go back and finish our problem statement so we can do the simulation. Okay, so from the far starting problem, we've added these details. 500 meters for the cable length, which was based upon the time delay. 83.3 based upon the reflection coefficient. And back here at the source, 1.6 volt pulse. And we calculated that by the 0.8 volts from the we see at the input to the scope which is halfway in terms of an impedance because of the 50 ohm 50 ohm split of the cable and the uh, source 
Now we're ready to do the simulation in PSPICE. So at the receiving end, we have a gamma or change in reflection coefficient. And we must have a reflection because we see the result in the waveform. So we have the reflection coefficient calculation is ZF minus ZO over ZF plus ZO. So gamma R is always the impedance you are moving into minus your transmission impedance divided by the sum. So that becomes the reflected impedance or voltage over the incident. Now we know the incident, because we're ignoring losses, will be 0.8. So now we have to figure out how do we get to the reflected voltage. So the second equation we're going to use is the total voltage. The total voltage is always the incident plus the reflected, at least at the reflection time. So we know from the waveform that the reflected value or the total voltage must be equal to 1 because that's the value we see in the waveform. So the total will be 1 and the incident we know to be 0.8. So obviously ER, the reflected portion at the, at the load end, is going to be 0.2 volts, which leads us to a gamma of one quarter or 0.25. So the total voltage of one volt equals the incident 0.8 plus the reflected. So 0.2, this leads us to a gamma of 0.25. Now we're going to reverse this calculation to see what the fault impedance is. Remember, ZO is already known to be 50 ohms for that cable. All right, so gamma is 0.25 which is equal to the ZF minus ZO over ZF plus ZO. We write, we do the cross multiplication to multiply that out. We get 0.25 times ZF plus ZO equals ZF minus ZO. So what we're going to do now is move the ZO over to this side by adding ZO to both sides. That way it'll disappear over here. And on we're going to move this term of 0.25 ZF to this side by subtracting this value. Okay, following the math, moving the two terms from each side, adding Z sub O, subtracting 0.25 ZF, we end up with ZO plus 0.25 ZO, ZF minus 0.25 ZF, right? So that's 1.25 ZO equal to 0.75 ZF. If we put a ratio of ZF over ZO, we have 1.25 over 0.75. That's a ratio of 5 over 3. And that's 1.66. ZF then is equal to 50 ohms, which was the ZO value times 1.66. So ZF is now 83.3 ohms. So here's a copy of the handout you'll be getting, which goes through the process to use P-SPICE in the labs at Cal Poly. You can also do it at home using uh, multi-SIM or other versions of P-SPICE. To create a file, a text file or circuit file, to be used in the program called AMS Simulator, which is within the Cadence, um, which is the company that owns PSPICE. So look for Cadence AMS Simulator and run that program. Okay, so here is the file that we are going to run in the AMS Simulator or PSPICE. It's just a few lines.
The first line is shown as the T-line demonstration. So that's just the title line, but you must have a title line. There must be something there. This star actually tells Peace Spice to ignore that line, but it will ignore the first line of any file. The next line is our voltage source. Now we we so we have a source that we've created between nodes 1 and 0. And it's going to be a pulse signal. Now the numbers shown here are detailed in the handout, but basically this is the starting voltage of 0 volts, the pulse voltage of 1.6 volts, this is when that pulse starts and we say time 0, and the rise and fall time at 1 um, picosecond. We want to look at very fast rise times. The last number is the length of the pulse, which is 1 second. So now we have the RS, or the source impedance, 1 to 2 of 50 ohms. That was in our circuit. And then here is the transmission line. T1, it's connected between nodes 2 and 0. And nodes 3 and 0 will be the output. We have spaces in here. The spaces separate the data. And the Z sub O of the cable is 50 ohms. So that can be Z0 or Z0, it doesn't matter. And then the time delay is 2.5 microseconds. Um, we don't put a specific RG8 cable in there, but it, that's how we describe it. The last part is the load between nodes 3 and 0 of 83 ohms. And then we have such transient statement to collect data, probe to allow us to do pictures, and then the end statement to end the file. That's all we need to do to simulate our circuit. So here is what is a little nice about using the old text version of PSPICE. I can copy that file or that text description, go over to PSPICE here, and create a new fi text file, and then paste the data in there. Control V. You can, at the very, you can see there's actually eight lines there. The eight line has nothing, so delete that value. That might cause an error in the program. Now, we need to save this file, and we need to do it in a special way. So I'll, I'll save the file. File, save as. Now, we need to describe the file in a method that the PSPICE can read. And you'll see some of my sample files here. Here's one that we, we use. You'll notice that there's a .cir in the file name. Now that's important for us because that tells PSPICE or AMS Simulator to treat that circuit. So I'm going to list that as cinema2-4.cir. You must include that .cir or PSPICE won't be able to read it. Save that file, and then now close that file. Now we're going to reopen the file, but since it's now a circuit file, it will be easier for us to read, or PSPICE will recognize it. So the default is the data or .dat files, select circuit files, and we see the circuit we created 2-4. We open it up and we see the details that we've just talked about. All right, now we see the green button or the run button available. Now, if you didn't save it as a .cir file, the text file will not come in properly and you won't see the green button. So we push the green button and we get a blank screen which shows us the uh, waveforms that we can draw pictures with. So we're going to select trace, add a trace, the, turn off the currents and power, we don't need those. So let's look at the three voltages. V1 is obviously the input source. And we see this green waveform at times zero the pulse jumps up to 1.6 volts.
All right, now let's add the second trace, which is V2, that's the input to the transmission line. And here we see that at um, point A, it starts out at point A, and after some length of time, and if we go down here, 5 microseconds, it jumps up to 1 volt. All right, so that waveform is exactly the one described in the problem. Let's look at the voltage at the end of the line, which is node 3. So node 3, add that. And what we see is the blue, and we see at two and a half microseconds, which is the time it took the green pulse to travel, actually the red pulse, to travel down the line, the voltage jumps up to one volt. Now, why does the load jump before the source? Well, it takes time for this red pulse to travel down to the load and then be reflected back to the source. So that is the time delay effect we see on a cable. Use the handout and see if you can simulate other circuits.